thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. <laughs> yes, I would love to start with our first topic, which is being multi-passionate. What is your advice on honoring all parts of you? Yeah, so uh, personally for me, since, you know, growing up, I grew up in a family that was multidisciplinary. So my dad worked in politics and he worked in, uh, you know, he studied philosophy. We've had all of our house. My brother studied, you know, engineering. We've had constantly um, uh, a mix of conversations, a mix of backgrounds always present on the table. And I think that, you know, um, uh, allowed me to discover that I have multiple interests and multiple things that I want to do in life. Um, and for me, it's um, it, whenever I kind of stop doing one of them and focus on purely engineering on, or purely, you know, uh, one part or one bit of my uh, uh, things I'm passionate about, it, it always makes things less satisfying. You make, it makes you feel a lot less fulfilled in your work and your success. And for me, honoring all parts of yourself is by providing yourself the opportunity and making the time to allow for the different passions and the different interests you have to be all uh, fulfilled within your main, I guess, focus that you're doing. Um, which can be a multiple routes that we can that we can talk about, but kind of putting a priority of all these different um, identified interests that you have is always important. From your experience doing this, do you think that we have to solely focus on one thing till we get good at it? Or can we shift our balance towards all of our passions and chip away at everything at once? Yeah, so that's a very, very interesting question that is a bit harder to answer because it really depends on each person and how they, approach such um, uh, uh, a topic. Personally, for me, I I have some passions that I'm, that I'm interested in. I decided to focus on studying one major. And throughout my studies of aerospace engineering, I discovered along the way additional passions. And I discovered additional interests that I didn't even know existed before. Uh, for example, interested in, in law. I, yeah, I always thought it's cool, but I never thought like something I'd be interested enough to want to pursue it there's a lot of things you know to keep yourself open while you're you know studying or pursuing one thing so I think for me it was a mix of both I tried to allow some space for some extra passions that I have when it comes to arts and things like that but I definitely wanted to keep along the way a, a space open to discover new things to learn new things which won't necessarily chip away from my main uh, degree focus but rather make you more multidisciplinary which is also something that a lot of companies and a lot of people and a lot of you know folks around you look at as something valuable because you can give a very new different perspective on any topic with all these interests that you have so across your interests with engineering, policy, entrepreneurship, and the arts, how do you navigate the emotions of wanting to do it all and knowing that each of them have their own time and place? So uh, an example would be caught up doing problem sets for one thing, but really in your heart, you're being called to do this other thing and yeah. reconciling those different urges at any given point of time or day yeah so it, it's it's a hard thing it's I, I don't I don't think I'm perfect at doing that um either but I think the way I approach it is one I'm really grateful for being a student throughout this time during my PhD for a long period because I think being a student gave me a lot more flexibility and a lot more time allowance to be like able to explore a few more options than, a, than you know, a, necessarily a job can give you a flexibility to do. I was also lucky to have um, a thesis advisor that allowed me to pursue some of my interests within my thesis. So my, my PhD is an aerospace engineering PhD, but it does have a policy and law part. So that allowed me within my studies to kind of do something interdisciplinary. But I always, um, yeah, I'm the type of person who loves people, love talking, love going out, love being with people around me, but I need to reset at certain points. So I have these times where I say like, I want to paint. And painting is extremely messy. So I know when I'm painting, I cannot touch my email. I cannot touch my computer. And I dedicate this, you know, day or evening or so to just doing that. And it helps me reset uh, uh, going forward. But I think it's, it's always... Like to listen to what I'm feeling like doing because sometimes if I sit on my computer and I'm trying all day to write parts of my thesis but nothing is happening 
that's a wasted day. So I'd rather have done a painting in it because I knew I'm not going to be productive anyway, reset my clock and kind of start something new afterwards. So that's kind of how I approach it. But again, I'm not perfect at it either. So it's a difficult thing to navigate, um, uh, but it's good to have options and flexibility and talking to your advisors, talking to your boss, talking to people around you might actually alleviate some of the pressure to do one thing because they could actually appreciate that and allow you and give you within your time frame time to focus on that bit that you're interested in. I love that. And what I heard from you is both articulating all your different passions so that people around you know the different ways in which you might be pulled and also yeah. honoring your knowing when you feel pulled or called in one direction on a day when maybe you've penciled or scheduled in that something else was supposed to happen. Yeah. And what you said lets us transition so well into our second topic, which is turning grief into art policy and advocacy. And so I would love to chat about your thoughts on um, how you've had to form this mindset of taking these really challenging things that you see on the news and particularly seeing it from afar to then process it into something both beautiful and time consuming and meticulous so yeah. that you go through all the motions of channeling the grief into um, some other product, a piece of policy, art, mm -hmm. what have you. I was curious if you could walk us through how that mindset shift has evolved for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me personally, it's kind of dependent on, dependent on the grief specific that I'm passing through. So I think uh, during undergrad, um, you know, as, as you're well aware, as international students, we always have problems, you know, with careers and jobs and being represented. And I was just coming from Lebanon. I was really young. I was trying to, ooh, the US and explore and learn and everything is new to me. So I didn't feel at the time empowered enough to be able to change or advocate for any of the things I'm passing through because I thought, oh, that's, you know, that's the system. It is what it is. I'm just gonna have to live with it. Um, and also I was kind of a minority in my, uh, uh, you know, education team because I was the only international I was the only person who's passing through a lot of these problems so I didn't feel that I have enough leverage to make a difference but I think through my time in the U.S. I started to realize as soon as I started to talk to people around realizing how much of a big problem this is to a lot of people that empowering gave me a leverage to be able to turn quote unquote the grief into something that could be more steps forward to take an effort. Um, I was lucky to have some platforms to be able to, you know, use or advocate for these things to be able to try to make a difference. But for me, if I, 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 it's hard for me to stay silent on a lot of topics. And I think bottling that up inside has always been a problem because I, I need to let it go. I need to, you know, let it out somehow. So when it comes to things that I can actually make a difference in, I've been trying a lot to, you know, over the years to bigger my network, grow my network around, talk to more people, know where the best or where the best platforms to target or the best people to um, uh, get advice from, get, get network, get connected to. All of these, I think, empower you a lot to try to make a difference. But for things that I think are really out of my hand, I think, you know, especially in 2020 with the pandemic happening and then Lebanon passed through a really, still passing through a, a really difficult period. Then the Beirut explosion happened, all that. I think these are things that I didn't feel particularly able to change. I just, something horrible happened and I wasn't able to quote unquote advocate for a difference there. So for these things is where uh, outlets like art and painting and things like that were the avenue because it was kind of a distraction where I can put all my emotions out and think about just this one thing at the moment that I'm doing it. Um, but, but these are kind of the main, I guess, ways or the main uh, tracks that I try to go and pursue over over the years with different types of events going on. Thank you so much for sharing and I think what I took away from that was having different buckets and mm -hmm. tools for the ways in which grief shows up and categorizing it as what is in my control and what can I contribute to versus what is simply 
not in my control. And I think what throws us in a loop is the things that feel out of control. And I'd love to dive deeper into the art piece. Given that you're multi-passionate, how do you approach devoting your time to art um, and disconnecting from the need to be productive and simply creating for the sake of creating and also not falling into that trap of um, even creating to um, distract ourselves from something happening in the world just to simply uh, engage and embrace just that joy of creation. Yeah, yeah. I think personally for me, I, I write poetry a lot and I paint a lot. So these are my two kind of uh, outlets when it comes to that. And I, I pursue, like I have normally when I want to paint or when I want to, you know, write something, there's something bugging inside of me all day. If I, I like, I feel like I want to do it. So it ends up being a lot of times, yes, a distraction, but also something that has been on my mind for a long time that I want to do. Um, I, right next to me, my easel is next to me. I always have an empty canvas on it in order to keep reminding myself to have easy access to be like, all right, if I can't do this today, if I'm feeling like it, canvas is here, my easel is here, I'm going to do it. But one thing that I mentioned uh, before is specifically with painting, what I really like about it is it's a really such a messy art that I really cannot do anything else while I'm doing it. The moment I commit to starting a painting, my entire room converts to studio and I just cannot check my email. I cannot reply to anything. I cannot do work. And I think that that kind of forces me to, you know, uh, uh, focus on the thing I'm doing. It's a bit harder sometimes when I write because I'm like, oh, should I be writing my thesis instead of writing this? But when I'm painting, I'm like, this total disconnect. So that, that does help me a lot. And I think the feedback I get from people around also reinforces how much I love it. Like sending my painting to, you know, my, my friends or to my parents or, you know, getting feedback on, you know, what people think about it. It also reinforces that that's something I enjoy and, you know, it's something good as a product out of it. So it helps me pursue that uh, uh, a bit a bit more often and disconnect it from the world but um it doesn't happen as often a lot of these things in art tend to be ups and downs uh where i have you know you have phases when you paint every night and you have phases when you just don't pay for three months and i think that's okay embracing that part is also okay because it's similar to work you cannot be constantly productive and you cannot be constantly using that as an outlet but when you feel like it you know making space and making time in your day to really pursue it is something important and something really appreciated by others as well, which reinforces its importance to you. Um, and it stops being a distraction, but really being an, a, a something, a product that people enjoy and you enjoy as well. Thank you so much for giving me that visual of turning your room into a studio, because that is absolutely something I'm looking to now emulate in my work life, because I feel as though there's that little artist in so many of us when we were toddlers and somewhere along the way, uh, some of us might lose that version of us that I think um, honoring them with a dedicated workspace, uh, a canvas, um, an easel that you can see all the time and just getting really messy with it, yeah. um, I think is such a great visual that I'm really looking forward to <laughs> creating. So thank you. Yeah, embracing the mess. <laughs> Absolutely, embracing the mess. And with um, that turning to grief piece, we've discussed art. I'd love to chat more about um, the policy side mm -hmm. Um, and particularly its relation to networking. So being able to create the networks you need to build the platforms to then advocate for the change you want, um, mm -hmm. particularly being um, from marginalized communities in aerospace uh, and having that network to make sure that despite being from a marginalized community, we can still, um, do really big things. And so yeah. I'd love for you to tell me about creating opportunities as a foreign national and young leaders like yourself to have a voice on platforms such as the New York Times uh, and TED and across MIT. How have you approached building the connections you need to make this happen? Um, and beyond just writing to them, 
uh, how have you made sure that you write in a way in which they do respond to you? Yeah, yeah. So to walk you through a bit kind of the journey of getting to, to, to do that. So when I came from Lebanon and undergrad to MIT, there is this mentality that it's okay if people sometimes discriminate against you because you have a bigger goal of you have this bigger goal of getting the dream job. So it's okay if it's, you know, more feeling marginalized. It's okay if the opportunities are not equal. It's okay if people are treating you differently. You'll get, you'll get to a point where you have a green card and you can stay in the country. And for a while, I thought that's normal. And I thought this is, okay, if I'm not getting the opportunities and all my classmates are having jobs and internships and I'm not, that's okay. At some point, I'd be able to do it. Yeah, but me too. It, yeah, you, yes. you start like that, right? Because you have this, especially if coming from countries that are not necessarily as quote unquote developed or technologically advanced as other countries, you always feel this feeling inside of it. It's okay to be feeling less because you are coming from a place that's less. So I will, you know, try to take that in. And at some point when I'm it's a, a citizen or something, I can, you know, start doing my work. And that for me is something that really occupied how I deal with things for a couple of years. And again, the fact that no one around me was sharing or like was international passing through and passing through made it difficult for me to see otherwise or do something otherwise. But it kind of things keep adding up until you reach a point where kind of you're fed up with everything around you. You feel like it's so unfair. That's really ridiculous. I'm not getting enough for learning. I'm not able to, you know, uh, pursue the things that I want to pursue. And at that point, year after year, it gets, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. And you want to do something about it. So it really was for me up until I started, like I, I constantly try to voice these things. But for me, the main effect is when I started grad school, I was involved with one of the organizations, student organizations in Air Astro. It's called a J cubed, um, the Graduate Association of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And there, I, um, after um, uh, elections, I uh, got elected as the international chair uh, representing international students in the department. And being in that position was the first step that was very empowering. I was like, all right, I'm in a position that I can talk on behalf of students. I can connect to faculty, connect to other organizations across the US. And that is the way that I started, you know, building and voicing these things at a higher level. Um, and I think what happened is that also came at the same time of uh, during the previous administration of a lot of things happening one after the other after the other, of just decision after decision that was just making life so difficult. So I started working and connecting with the other bigger organizations at MIT uh, that at that point were trying to also advocate for things in the DC office at MIT and trying to talk about you know higher policies. I was like, wow, we can actually talk to the DC office. like. I didn't know that was a thing. We can actually advocate for real policy change. I thought I'd just accept these things. Um, and the moment I realized how much, you know, we can change if we just put the effort and how much pressure we can make and universities to make this effort happen, the more I started to connect to bigger people, bigger platforms being able to do that. And the nice part about a lot of these things is one thing pushes the other. So for me, the, uh, uh, when the changes in OPT and that was about to happen in the previous administration, um, a lot of news outlets were actually reaching out to universities to get stories of students who you know are passing through these difficulties to portray them. So once they reach out to MIT, and MIT as for me as an international um, uh, chair, they were like, you can talk on behalf of that. And I was like, all right, yep, I can do that. So voice my story. That story in itself opened opportunities of like folks from TED talking to you, like, do you want to talk about this as a topic? Do you want to? So I think, and a lot of times it's like um, uh, uh, pieces of dominoes. The, 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 the doing one thing is going to allow it itself doing more and more, and it would grow your network automatically. That in the beginning, I had to put so much effort to grow my network, and right now it's a bit, it's a lot less, it's a lot easier, I guess, to portray that. Um, but this is kind of the, yeah, this is kind of the main ways of, I guess, I try to advocate for a lot of these things and empower these things on platforms. Uh, a lot of something to know, news outlets need you. They need your story. They cannot write your stories. They cannot advocate for things without you. So it's a give and take. You want them as much as they want you. You want to voice these problems as much as they want a story to write about. So 
um, uh, 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 don't find it intimidating, I guess, to be able to talk on these platforms. Absolutely. And I think what is so powerful is you sharing your day one with people who may be seeing your, um, you know, day 100,000. So I think when you see someone on these large platforms advocating for things that directly impact them, they think, oh my gosh, they must have, you know, always known these people. But that's never the case. You built those connections intentionally. And it's so powerful knowing how you positioned yourself um, Mm -hmm. by aligning yourself with the things that you deeply cared about. It was never um, out of alignment. And I think that's the best way to attract the um, opportunities and um, the mic to be able to say the things that you really want to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's kind of a feedback loop. Like once you know that you are able to make a difference in one thing, it empowers you to do more with the others, you know? Once we saw like with all the advocacy that like the ICE um, a decision of letting students leave the US with virtual, once that with the, all the pressure happening got removed, you're like, all right, we can make a difference. Like we can change these things. So that, that feedback loop, it reinforces you as much. Um, Thank you so much for putting yourself out there so that so many people from around the world can benefit from your voice and your story. I'd love to jump into what I'd like to call the rapid fire round, but (laughs) if you need any more time with any of the questions, feel free to do so. So my first question is, what does wellness mean to you? Personally, for me, it means putting yourself as a priority and a lot of times, whether you feel like your priority today is the working version of you and the productive version of you, then let that be. If the priority today is to really take a break and go on a hike and come back and be productive, let that be it. So I think wellness is putting yourself first and taking care of yourself first because none of the other things you want to do are going to happen without putting yourself first. Um, And a lot of us, you know, end up in tracks where that's not necessarily an option, but making sure it is, is always important. Absolutely. And With all of your experiences across these platforms, what does effective leadership mean to you? Yeah, it's for for me, it's being able to listen to the people you're trying to to lead and communicate properly. Because a lot of times what happens, whether it's leadership in universities, leadership in uh, careers, not being able to get a sense of what your team is like, of what is going on in terms of problems, how to advocate properly for certain things that people are passing through, how to represent them properly, and how to communicate their feelings and their problems and awareness properly is a big part of what leadership is. So the, there's a bit obviously about, you know, being able to keep the work going, keep the flow of things happening, but to do something that's, you know, more for longer term, I guess, uh, you can't do that without being able to communicate and understand the feelings and opinions and uh, uh, struggles of the people that you're, and appreciating their diversity, appreciating their, and putting an effort to represent that, to, to address certain things is always important for any team that you end up uh, in. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'd love to know more about your morning and night routine and what helps you bounce back when and if you fall off track? Yeah, I that is a difficult one for me because my routine is all over the place. I feel it's, I, I struggle with being really good at that and I need to be more efficient. I tend to be a really productive at night and I embrace that. Uh, um, it, it allows me all my writing, my thesis literally probably is written between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. That's kind of the most productive time and I realized that I just accepted that this is the thing so I'm gonna uh, I try to balance sleeping more in the in the morning scheduling my meetings in a way that accommodates that I'm not an early riser per se so I just accepted that you know this is how the way my productivity works and to shift things through it um I think I try to constantly allow some time for working out some time for seeing friends because I need that in my life. If I don't, I just cannot do work. Um, And I try to balance these things, but I don't have necessarily a good routine because different weeks have different schedules, have different things. The constants that keep me getting back to it are the moment I do a workout again, I'm like, all right, I'm back. 
and the schedule so i need to continue doing it um these things help me get back but in general i struggle with having a really good routine uh and and, and allowing that and your honesty with that is really important because folks listening are at all different uh, parts of the spectrum of being um, and really loving routine or being on the other end of um, taking just each day as it comes. And I've always personally been someone who really, really struggles with routine because there is this rebellious person inside of me that is rejecting every routine, even <laughs> though it is one of the things that um, does make me the least anxious. So thank you so much for sharing yeah. that because there's always someone who feels that way and can relate. And yeah. I've loved all of your responses across everything that I've asked you. I was wondering if you had any other um, lingering thoughts on anything that we've spoken about. Yeah, I, I want to thank you again for doing these talks and all the advocacy that you've been doing in your part. You can't imagine how much impact you've made on a lot of students and a lot of you know work that's been going on all across. So having more people like you and more advocacy happening and more focus, not just on sciences and engineering, but really the aspects of wellness and advocacy and how to how do you thrive, not just work, um, is very important. So I just wanted to thank you for everything you've been doing as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing, Maya, because I think for me, when I came here, um, feeling less than felt was so normalized that I had to really pull myself up to say, well, I don't want to feel this way. Why does um, why does my dream have to um, make me feel so anxious and yeah. or like we're on fire? <laughs> yeah. Why does it have to um be like that where it has to be either or and so thank you so much for joining me and sharing all these um really great tips on art particularly because there's so much um healing through art and I think that this episode will really really you know prompt people to pick up that easel and canvas and paintbrush so thank you so much oh, for your time I hope that helps and yeah it was it was a pleasure talking to you and hope a lot more people feel you know more empowered to advocate for more things do more things and just enjoy the work that they're doing not just for the sake of work but for the sake of enjoying it absolutely thank you so much